Remind you, when I worked example five for the crankcase example last time, I forgot on the back side of that, it was two-sided. On the back side of that is a table from a different textbook than ours, which lists all the important dimensionless parameters in heat transfer. So if you want a summary of what those parameters are and how to calculate them, it's on the back side of that example 5.4 that I worked in class last time. If you didn't get the handouts of the example midterm problems I passed out last time from previous years after class, I've got copies of those up here in front. You can pick up a copy of that. These are more problems that I uh, said I'd get to you today. These again are example, not examples, they're the real problems that I gave in midterms, probably 2018 and 19. And one more, there you go. Mm -hmm. So these problems, cover chapters one three five twelve and thirteen so you've got problems worked here for those five chapters now so you've probably got now a total of ten problems from previous midterms I gave in several years ago before COVID um, so we're going to start out today and, and look at the end of chapter, actually it goes into two chapters, uh, eight and 11, which we didn't cover, but it, I just want to briefly mention this material. And then we'll uh, look at chapter eight handout in just a second. He's got enough there, I think, for those two behind you. Okay, so there should be three there. Okay. This is a chapter eight handout. Let's just do five here. Okay. Okay, so um, the first one is the introduction of chapter 11 on heat exchanger types, but I'll I'll mention that in about 15 minutes, so we'll hold on to that one. Um, then the other handout is from chapter eight, section seven of our textbook called Heat Transfer Enhancement. So chapter eight is internal flows, tubes and pipes. And this is what he says with the big black arrows going to it. I'll read it. Several options are available for enhancing heat transfer associated with internal flows. Enhancement may be achieved by increasing the convection coefficient and or by increasing the con uh, convection surface area. So we know from chapter one and all convection And we talked about it before. If you want to increase heat transfer by convection, then you can increase H or you can increase A if the temperature difference is set. So he says, for example, 
H may be increased by introducing surface roughness to enhance turbulence. For example, through machining or insertion of a coil spring wire. The wire insert shown in the figure below, and I'll show you an example in just a minute, provides a helical roughness element in contact with the tube inner surface. So one way you can increase heat transfer is to roughen the inside of the tube or insert something in it which creates turbulence. Both of those guys increase H. Don't forget, if we want good heat transfer in a tube or pipe, we want turbulent flow. So we want to somehow increase the turbulence of the flow. Okay, keep reading. Alternately, the convection coefficient may be increased by introducing swirl through the insertion of a twisted tape, figure shown below. The insert consists of a thin strip that's periodically twisted through 360 degrees, introducing a tangential velocity component, increases the speed of the flow, particularly near the tube wall. The heat trend, now that's, that's to increase turbulence. Remember in tube flow, So our velocity looks like that. Near the tube walls, the velocity is low. I don't want the velocity low if I want good heat transfer. I want a higher velocity near the inner tube wall. That's why he says there, you put this thin strip periodically twisted through 360 degrees Introduction of a tangential velocity component increases the speed of the flow, particularly near the tube wall. Okay. Second thing, maybe I want to increase the area to increase or enhance the convection heat transfer. The heat transfer area may be increased by manufacturing a tube with a grooved inner surface, shown below in a picture, while both the convection coefficient and the area may be increased by using spiral fins or ribs, again shown in a picture below. In evaluating any heat transfer enhancement scheme, attention must also be given to the attendant increase in pressure drop and hence the pump power. So if you're gonna, if you're gonna you know, if you're going to put twisted tapes in there and grooves, uh, put grooves in the side of the tube and roughen the tube, we know from fluid mechanics that's going to increase the uh, pressure drop or increase the pump power for the same volumetric flow rate. So you pay a penalty. So one side, you got better heat transfer. The other side, you're going to pay the penalty of more pump power required. So it, you have to decide what's, what's your priority. Okay, so we'll get into that in just a second, but let me first of all pass out this last handout. This is something you can look at before next week studying for the final. It's a summary of each chapter and what important things are in each chapter. Okay, um, it's, it's not in great detail. It's hitting the highlights of each chapter, the highlights. But you can use this as a guide tape to more. When you make up, for instance, your equation sheet, which you've already got. And by the way, you know what I said before. The final exam is four problems. One problem for sure, chapter nine, free convection. Three problems, my choice, from the other chapters we covered in the class. Uh, you can bring to the exam three equation sheets, both sides, eight and a half by 11. They can be the same ones you previously used. They can be three completely new ones, uh, but make sure that you add chapter nine material to those three sheets of paper. Add chapter nine material. 
Uh, um, by the way, the first page starts chapter one, then chapter four, review. And then back of the first page, chapter two, chapter three. Now, at the bottom of the page says chapter four. No, you know what that is. BO number, that's chapter five. So at the first page, the back side of the page, at the bottom, it says chapter four. Mark that out. That is chapter five. Then it goes into chapter 12 then chapter 13, then chapter 6, 7, and 8. 6, 7, and 8. And four problems, two hours, roughly 30 minutes per problem, more time than the midterm. Midterm, two problems, 50 minutes. Now it's two problems, 60 minutes, so a little more time for each problem. Okay, any questions on that then before we go on? All right. Um, I'll post them on Friday, but office hours next week, Monday, 9 to 10. Wednesday, your exam is 9 to 11, office hour, 7.30, 8.30, 7.30, 8.30, Wednesday, before your exam, next Wednesday. And there's one on Friday, but if you want, it's the same time as Wednesdays, 7.30, 8.30 on Friday. Okay, any questions on office hour then? Okay, all right, so we go back to chapter three, conduction heat transfer, and a little bit of hardware here. You know, we can, we can look at some things like, oh, how we engineers insulate pipes. And let's see what I've got here. Oh, yeah, here we, here's one here. Obviously, you know, in, in your attic, you want to insulate a hot water pipe or something. You've got these guys, okay? Lightweight, cheap, snap them on the pipe, you're done. There in the attic, hopefully no leaks. It's not going to be weather resistant. If you're in the field doing insulation of pipe fittings, this one here is a T. You slap this guy on both sides, you put some weather resistant tape on it, and then there's your insulation. Preformed, 45 degree. This thing here can insulate a pipe, fiberglass, okay. It's weather resistant, luminized, so you reduce any kind of like radiation. You wrap this guy around the pipe nice thing about this is the guys in the field, all they've got to do is they just snap it together. There, snaps together. Your pipe is in here. Put some tape on, weather resistant, comes in big, big, super big lengths, you know. Insulate pipes, I don't know, steam power plant, solar power plant, you name it, that's what they do. Different kinds of materials, of course. Here's that one that uh, I just showed you comes packaged. That's the samples. These samples were given to me by students who were in my class in previous years, and when they got a job in industry, they would call me and say, Professor Biddle, I've got some, some show and tell stuff here from my company. Do you want me to send it to you? And I say, yeah, please do. So they sent me this stuff, and it's really neat to show how it, uh, it's heat transfer stuff. So we talked about Radiation shields, chapter 13. We said radiation shields protect a hot surface from a cold surface. Uh, and what they, you do is you put, for instance, this aluminized, like a mylar type thing, this aluminum sheet, between a hot surface and cold surface, and you dramatically cut down the radiation heat transfer. This is a radiation shield. You know the equation. The, if the emissivities are all the same on the shields and the two hot and cold surfaces, uh, the, the um, equation for Q with N shields is equal to one over N plus one Q no shields. So if you have two shield, one shield, the transfer for one shield equal one over one plus one, that's what two, one half of Q of the uh, no shields. 
And then, as I told you before, you, normally you don't have one shield. Um, 20 to 30 shields. 20 to 30. Here's one here. Uh, this person sent me. Uh, I don't know, there's probably 15 to 18 shields in here. So 15 to 18 shields this company made. And there is a flat shield. There's the flat shield. And a dimple sheet. And a flat sheet and a dimple sheet. And a flat sheet, dimple sheet, flat sheet, dimple sheet. So, flat sheet. like this, dimple type sheet, flat sheet, dimple sheet, flat sheet, so on. I don't know, 15, 18, 21, whatever it is. Uh, aluminized material, cut down on radiation. But the problem is, the problem is when I make this thing, I've got to make sure these flat aluminum sheets don't touch each other. If they touch each other, boy, I just, I just ruined it. Now I've got conduction, great conduction, metal on metal. I don't want that. I got to find a way to separate these guys to keep a space between them so they don't touch and minimize conduction. And of course, they minimize radiation too. So this is one way to do it. Oh, there's. We engineers are very creative. There's many ways to do this. This is one way to do it. Because now, if this is hot and this is cold, the only way for heat to go from hot to cold is to take a rather torturous path. Heat comes in here, it goes to here. Heat goes up here, it stops there. It goes to here, it finally gets out there. You force it to make a torturous path from hot to cold. And that cuts down the conduction. Does it eliminate it? No, but it cuts it down dramatically because they only touch along these dimples. The dimples in there. So that's one way they do it. And then another possible way, they separate each aluminum sheet by a nylon mesh, nylon mesh, lightweight, not expensive, aluminum sheet, nylon mesh, aluminum sheet. Do the aluminum sheets touch? No. Does that reduce conduction? Of course it does. And then you package it in something like this. Th these came from one of former students, I think he worked at JPL, sent these to me. So here it is, inside of here, there's probably 15 to 20 sheets, aluminum. Each pair of aluminum sheets is separated by a nylon sheet. The nylon cuts down dramatically on the conduction. You've separated the aluminum, they're not touching each other. Since this is for a space application, you punch holes in this because the last thing you want, there's air between here on terrestrial, on the Earth. When you launch into space, you want to get the air out of there. You don't want convection in here, and the air would cause convection. So you punch holes in it so it outgasses the air, gets rid of the air. Now you've got a vacuum in there. Okay, so now you've got a vacuum. There's no, there's no convection. There's a minimal conduction and minimal radiation, and it's a great packaged shield. And here's another one, holes punched in here. Here's all the nylon sheets, you know, and there's multiple layers of aluminum in there. That's, that's a space radiation shield. You can use them terrestrially too for, for high temperature applications where you really are worried about um, maybe rocket design or uh, some high temperature uh, nozzles and things. Then of course, 
what they do is they package them in a nice little package for the space applications. So this is what you see is a big white blanket on something. They, they attach it with this up to the wall, you know, and then this way. And then they protect electronics, obviously. Optics, optics too. And this one is like sandpaper. You can feel it's really, really rough aluminum. So the, what they do here is they make each sheet of aluminum like a piece of sandpaper, and little bumps in the sandpaper, like aluminum here, keep it separated. Okay, separated. So there's different ways to keep those aluminum sheets separated. But the point is, they're all radiation shields. Okay, let's talk about, oh, the, the handout that talked about heat transfer enhancement. I'm not sure where this student went to work, but I was totally flabbergasted when he sent this stuff to me because it ties in to section 87 beautifully. So here is a tube, metal tube. Uh, it's supposed to increase heat transfer. So what they do is they jam a bristle brush in it. They jam a bristle brush, like a kitchen brush used to clean things. It's metal, no, it's metal. They jam it in there. What does that look like? It looks like a bunch of fins, little fins. Of course it is. The, uh, the idea is if this tube is hot, find a way to conduct the heat to the fluid near the middle, because I know the middle is going to be the coolest part of the fluid. So I do that by putting that bristle brush in there, because we know that you know, again, the middle two things. Here's the velocity profile. Here's the temperature profile. Hot tube. So if you want to heat something, I want to get that heat to the middle because that's the coldest part of the fluid. I don't like this either. I want higher velocity near the tube surface. I want to create turbulence in there. I want to mess up the flow. But believe me, this messes up the flow. You won't find this in a, in a textbook, okay? So, yeah, so how do I do that? Well, I, I told you, you you jam bristle brushes in the tubes. Here's one. You buy these things. They're big, long, big, long. Here it is. Helical like a spring. Like a helical spring. And they jam this inside the tube. Then they force the fluid. And the fluid swirls. And when it swirls, it really gets the velocity near the walls to be higher. That's what you want. Because the wall is hot. You want to take that heat out of there. So yeah, that picture in here is a helical coil spring, like, like a coil spring. Uh, handout. B. B is the uh, twisted tape. The insert consists of a thin strip that's periodically twisted through 360. Well, there it is, except they also added a spring to it. So they took this aluminum tube and they twist it. Crimp it, 360. Crimp it, 360. Then they put a spring on it because that spring is going to touch the wall and there'll be conduction heat in that metal spring uh, that runs around to this, to this aluminum tube. And the aluminum tube's in the middle, so it gets hot. So it enhances heat transfer that way. Oh, the creativity is just phenomenal. So there's a twisted tape with a spring in it. They use a tube. Hmm. This one is C. C is these 
fins, which are machined in here. Can you imagine the expense of this guy? Those fins in there, and it's helical. You want the swirling. You want to create tur turbulence by swirling. You want to get that fluid near the inside wall of the tube. There it is. You insert these guys. You can see the end. They look like a bunch of fins. You can imagine the cost to machine these guys. Oh yeah, okay, so what it is here, you can see that these guys are gonna be, they're really tight in there, so they're touching the wall of the tube. And so they're a fin, so they take the heat out of the tube and the heat goes it inward. And oh, I didn't show you that, but it's hollow inside of there too. So that's where the fluid is flowing. Plus it's flowing past this. So it's heating the middle of the core of it by the fins conducting heat into the center area, yeah. Refrigeration tube, aluminum, refrigeration tube. Almost. Inside of there, oh yeah. Refrigeration systems, they're just not round tubes. No, no, no. They have to enhance the heat transfer. Why do you, why do you want to enhance the heat transfer? Be, because, well, I'll show you in just a minute why they do it. We'll wait on that. Um, okay. Oh, circumferential fins. We discussed that chapter three. Circumferential fins. There they are. For instance, air blows over it. Fluid inside. You know, that spacing's critical between those. They don't ask the accountant how far apart they should be. No, they ask the engineer, how far apart should I space those fins? Because if you get them too close together, you're going to impede the flow of, let's say it's air, of air over those fins. Watch out, it's gonna become a stagnant air zone and then, then it's really bad. It's an insulator then. So you wanna space them out far enough so that air goes through here and takes the heat away from the fin. So the fins, enhance the heat transfer on the outside. That's why you add fins, to increase A so Q goes up. Right, exactly, that's what fins do. Now, if you're not happy with the inside, what you do is you put a bristle brush in the inside. This was sent to me by one of my students who worked for the company that did this. So now you're enhancing the heat transfer on the inside of the tube, not just the outside. So that is a double way to increase the heat transfer. And then you can have um, on the first handout, section 11.1 of this one, 11.1, this is our book. On the back side, it says compact heat exchangers. And this heat exchanger is picture D, D. Okay, so uh, D is a fin, a plate fin single pass. Plate fin single pass. So here, first of all, okay, there's the flow passages on these horizontal plates, horizontal plates. You can see the little tiny holes in there, little tiny holes that could be conducting a fluid. And then, for instance, air would pass over this way. This is called a cross flow heat exchanger. My two fingers are at 90 degrees, they're normal, cross flow. One fluid flows this way, one fluid flows this way. Cross flow heat exchanger. Interesting, these guys between these two plates, they're fins, but all they did was take a sheet of metal and bend it, U-shaped, up and down, bend it, bend it, bend it, bend it. It just goes up, down, 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 okay? Then they attach it to these other flat horizontal plates carrying a fluid. Cross-flow heat, compact cross-flow 
heat exchanger. <laughs> Talk about fins. Oh, boy. Look at that guy. You think he costs the money to make this thing? Oh, my gosh, I'll say. Look at those fins. Gee. They split halfway up into two fins from one fin. Very creative stuff that we mechanical engineers do to solve heat transfer problems. Very creative stuff. Beautiful. Could be in, a, in an art gallery. It's so beautiful. Um, another one. Refrigeration system. Cross flow. Flows down, flows this way. Two fingers at nine degrees. Normal flow. Cross flow. Heat exchanger. What are you trying to do? If you've got a liquid in here, it's not just a hollow tube again. No, it's not a hollow tube. That's not the way these heat exchanges are made. There's, there's little like fins in there, little like fins in there. So the gas air, for instance, goes this way, and maybe the uh, liquid goes this way, where you have these little tubes with fins. Oh, you can see the creativity and the Amount of money is spent trying to design the perfect one. Eh, just so you, this is a, this is a, this is a solar collector, okay? Carrying water. It's black, of course, to absorb solar radiation. You got your fin here, okay? And they attach here and here to another flow passage here and here. So, solar collector design, heat exchanger. Uh, then you got this guy. I think this guy worked for an automotive company. Uh, I think it's a trans oil cooler. Trans oil cooler, I believe he said. Again, air this way, trans oil this way, cross flow heat exchanger. I think if you ask someone, and said, you know, those tubes, you know, they're carrying a fluid. Are they, are they hollow? Oh, no, they're not. Oh, no, they're not. You don't know it, and probably a lot, a ton of people don't know it. They say, yeah, here's my trans all cooler down there. <laughs> Helical fins inside of each one of these flow passageways. Wow, wow. They're not just hollow tubes, no. Why? Well, I can tell you one reason why is because you want to increase heat transfer, increase the area of it. The engineer says, no, no, hey, hold it, hold it. I got a radiator in there. I've got this in front of my engine. I can't afford a lot of space. I can't afford a big thing to take the heat out of there. Well, if you can't afford that, then you better find a way to make him higher. Yeah, that's what this does. That makes that H bigger, which means they can make a more compact, smaller heat exchanger to put in front of the engine. So there's reasons for all this stuff like this. Does it cost more? Oh, you better believe it does. Is it worth it? It must be, because that's how they build them. Okay, so very interesting that, the, that people don't really know what's in these tubes in there. Okay, good stopping point.